I got rid of everything because I realized I had sold myself out right. because I was trying to be the person that you wanted me to be to gain your respect. That's an equation that, you know, um, the Da Vinci Code couldn't work out. And so I realized <sighs> I was doing absolutely fine for eight years in my black T-shirt turning up on a motorbike. I'm going back there. And that's what I do now. I've turned up to, to Oscar parties, you know, walking into there, literally on the yeah. red carpet with a crash helmet in my hand. Because yeah. if you don't like that, that's fine by, by me and you. Yeah. You know, that's absolutely fine. But I'm not selling myself out for you. Hey, this is Kenny Aronoff at Uncommon Studios LA. And you're listening to Staring at the World with Bodine's Kurt Newman, a T. Torrance Productions original podcast. Hey everybody, it's Kurt Newman, Staring at the World, part two of my interview with Mr. Steve Sims of Bluefish, the founder and CEO. He's the, been called the real life Wizard of Oz for people with a checkbook, which is sounds like an incredible life to me. Um, we had a great discussion, talked about all kinds of stuff, including his childhood, all the way up through making dinners happen with people like uh, Andrew Bocelli, which is, you know, Incredible. He's got a million stories and he's a very motiva motivational speaker. So it's worth listening. If you listen to part one, you're going to want to hear part two. So tune in. And if you want to tune into his podcast, it's The Art of Making Things Happen with Steve Sims. You said the um, same thing I felt as well. I, I said earlier, I found myself standing in the studio in LA with a big time producer, T-Bone Burnett, on a Warner Brother record contract. After only having picked up that guitar for a few years, I found myself in this recording studio and, and felt like, see if this sounds familiar to you, that I was gonna be found out not knowing what I was doing. And I heard you say the same thing about when Bluefish was starting to take off and you were starting to do all this that uh, it's almost like getting away with murder. You were you couldn't believe or you felt like people were going to find out something wasn't real or right. Yeah, and um, I killed myself. Um, literally, my persona, it was, it, was, it was very horrific and I'll never forget it. There's a couple of pictures I've got up in my, um, in my office and one of these is a picture of the story that I'll tell you. But I've always been on two wheels from the age of 13. Okay, I don't have a car now. I've, I've got a lovely little collection of motorcycles and I'm always on two wheels. Always, even if I fly to another country, I rent a bike and I'm, I'm on two wheels. When I was uh, working with Ferrari, I had a very nice Ducati. Um, and I suddenly woke up one morning and thought, hang on a minute, I'm going to turn up at this event on a motorbike. Now, bearing in mind, I'd been doing this for seven, eight years prior. Right. But for some reason that day, your studio moment came to me in my bedroom. And I was like, I can't do this. I've got to look proper. And I took out all my earrings and I went down to the local tailor and I had these beautiful suits made. I bought a bloody expensive watch because I thought, hey, I've got to impress you. So I better buy an expensive watch. I bought a car. And it was this classic Ferrari because I was working with Ferrari. I got this beautiful little Ferrari Dino and I drove it from Switzerland down to Monaco. And there's a picture of me leaning up against this car at this party. And when we went into the party, there's another picture of me <laughs> between two of the biggest actors in the planet at the time, which was Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Sylvester Stallone, and just on the outskirts of us was the it couple of the time, which was Hugh Grant and Elizabeth Hurley. Do you remember those two? I sure do, yeah. Right. I'm, and I'm so, probably older than you. <laughs> just, just slightly. But I'm in this photograph in a suit, which I never wear. Yeah. And so when I came back, when I came back home and a few months later got the photographs back, um, this was the days that you used to send off the roll of film right. and get it posted back to you. I started going through these pictures and I realized I never went to the party. This, this, this recreation, this fake Steve turned up that day. I hit the bottle 
I got drunk badly for about three days. My friends turned up, dried me out, and we got rid of the watch in one day, put all the suits in the back of the closet, never wore them ever again, took the car up to get sold at uh, the local garage and put the watch in a, in a store to get hocked out. So I got rid of everything because I realized I had sold myself out right. because I was trying to be the person that you wanted me to be to gain your respect. That's an equation that, you know, um, the Da Vinci code couldn't work out. And so I realized I was doing absolutely fine for eight years in my black T-shirt, turning up on a motorbike. I'm going back there. And that's what I do now. I've turned up to, to Oscar parties, you know, walking into there, literally on the yeah. red carpet with a crash helmet in my hand. Because yeah. if you don't like that, that's fine by, by me and you. Yeah. You know, that's absolutely fine. But I'm not selling myself out for you. Yeah, you get a lot of that in life of people directing you of what you're supposed to be and have to be. And it's it's... It's always better to be who you are in this industry, even in my industry, especially. You know, I tell young kids that, like, what, what should I do in music? I'm just like, find out who you are and be who you are, because that always ends up being the thing that you do and sell best. And so that's it's great well, advice. A couple of things. No one fantastical did it by following anyone else. Any of the greats right. are unique. Yeah. So why do people instinctively try copycatting? Be you, because no one's you. So you're already unique for a start. And secondly, and especially in your industry, I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles. I live just outside in a place called Tarzana. Um, but here, you're almost told and forced oh. to believe what other people are saying. Yeah. Um, it's a real tough... This, no wonder this place can mess with your head. I, yeah. We both know many celebrities, and the common thing is, you know, don't ever believe your own press. Don't ever believe your own hype, right. you know? Um, and I remember I was with, um, and he's not a friend, but I was having dinner with Roger Daltrey, and he said he would come off concert where every day people were throwing pants on stage and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were cheering on him. And he'd fly back home and the wife would kick him in out of bed and go, hey, the bins have got to go out. Yeah. And wow. it was just like, I'm normal again, you know? And right. he said, you know, he would find himself and then lose himself and then find... He said it was a hell of a seesaw. Yeah, I got in trouble the first few times I was out in L.A. too because I came from a very blue-collared town in Wisconsin. And it was, you know, Wisconsin's in the middle of the country. It's People rarely go there or even know of it. I had someone once ask me if they had cement roads there <laughs> that's a little they knew about it but when i went to la we, you know i brought that blue collar humor with me and it it wasn't appreciated you know people would be like don't you just love it here and i'd be like i and i don't like it here at all and then they would just like me <gasps> like they were aghast at it how could you not love it so i had to learn how to like be in la and how to approach it and then it it took so oh you learning. have to you have to you have to speak angelino um, joking us like I heard an agent say, an agent will never say no. You know, they will they would defer it to, well, I wanted to get involved, but yeah. you know, the team, they will always defer it off or just not respond to you so that they don't have to say no. But there is a language here and it's two-thirds bullshit. So it's a tough one to grasp, but there is there is the uh, language of Angelino. Yeah. All right. Um, back to Bluefish. Um, at some point. You know, you're doing all these great parties and having a blast and stuff, but at some point did it, I think it became more about giving people experiences is a word you've used rather than just, I throw parties here or there. People come to you for incredible things they want to do, incredible experiences, and you're able to provide that for them. Can you tell uh, some of what you've done for people? I, I, I mentioned about the Michelangelo story. Maybe mm. you want to talk about that. Uh, some people might not have heard that, but things that you've done, you've worked with the Vatican and stuff, just incredible pl things where you were giving people experiences. It wasn't just, I'm going to throw this party for people. Yeah. I realized, I realized as I was growing and again, understand my whole career was a Trojan horse to get me to communicate to aff with affluent people, yeah. selling them a ticket to go and watch a concert. Well, anyone could do that, you know? I wanted to see how I could stand out. So if they wanted a ticket to a concert, I would then get them backstage to meet the person. I had a client that wanted to meet the rock band journey. Mm. I, it was called the cricket amphitheater at the time. I think it's called the AT&T amphitheater now down in San Diego. Changing, yeah. 
Yeah, it's always changing. I actually got a client and I got um, Journey to accept him to bring him up on stage and to sing four tunes as the temporary lead singer of Journey yeah. uh, instead of watching it from the from the seats. Incredible. And um, the Vatican, I had a client that wanted to get married in the Vatican by the Pope. Um, and then the one that you mentioned, I had a client ask me, and is is the the entirety of the request was I want the ultimate dining experience in Florence for me, my fiance, and my future mother and father in law, and that was it. Ultimate dining experience. <laughs> so I took over the Academia de Galleria uh, Museum. It's the world famous museum that houses Michelangelo's David. At nine o'clock at night, they entered. I had the museum shut down. I think it was like three o'clock in the afternoon to like two o'clock in the morning. And at nine o'clock in the evening, they turned up. There's a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, string quartet, piano, red carpet, roses. And then halfway through their pasta, I said that I had a local singer that would like to come in and serenade them while they ate their pasta. Is that okay? If it had said no, then I'd have been screwed. But he said, he said, yeah, that sounds great, Steve. And then I walked in with Andrea Bocelli. And the funny thing was, the museum has the greatest works of marble um, probably in the planet, okay? Yeah. The fiance, I won't mention her name, was so stunned that Andrea Bocelli had walked in to serenade them. She dropped her knife, and it seemed to be like about <laughs> 10 minutes before that reverb stopped. <laughs> and Andrea Bocelli just had this massive smile on his face <laughs> that he had shocked. But that's what I did. I listened, and I do it now with my coaching clients. I listen to what you want, and then start deconstructing that to find out what it is you actually need and lust for. Right. And that's, that's the core. I need to get to the core of why you want to do something. Again, back to this why. Why are you trying to do I need a million dollars. Why do you need a million dollars? What's a million dollars going to do for you? What impact are you going to generate with a million dollars rather than just focusing on, okay, you told me, let's go get it. So... I like to focus on the core reason by deconstructing it. And I did that with my concierge clients and I do it now with my coaching clients. Do you ever feel because of all your experiences in doing this, that maybe, you know, what people are looking for better than what they know themselves, you know, something they can't verbalize very well, but that in the end you can pull it out of them. I think the answer to that is yes and no. Do I see what they want? No, but I'm ready to go digging. Um, and as you've already said, they know what they want. They either won't admit it or they can't verbalize it. Yeah. So it's a case of, you know, I joke about getting my inner Sherlock Holmes out. I've got to go and discover why you're in front of me. You know, why did you take the time to call me? Why do you want to get in front of me? Why the hell do you want to put up with me? You know, there's got to be a reason for it. There's yeah. got to be a need. And it's more than likely not the first thing you've just said. Right. Right. And I, you know, I didn't really hear the Vatican story before the, so I didn't know anything about the Pope marrying someone. Like, how difficult <laughs> is something like that to deal with? I mean, that just, I wouldn't even oh. know where to begin to approach. So you, you actually, like that. you came out with the the single phrase there that will tell you why it will never be done again <laughs> to deal with. Yeah. Okay. It, the red tape, if you think the DMV has got ridiculous red <laughs> tape or your local COVID testing or the government, then you try and deal with the oldest establishment in the planet, yeah. the Vatican. The ultimate so to give, you a, to give you a story, okay, um, I had to, so many permits had to be done, yeah. okay? And uh, there's a, one of the houses on the side of uh, St. Peter's Square is the Thomas Aquinas house where a lot of the paperwork is stamped. And I submitted the paperwork. I was in Rome, submitted the paperwork. They told me about, about two or three weeks. So I came back to LA. Okay. Yeah. No point in wasting the client's money and being away from my family for that long. Right. So I got back here the following week, they contacted me and they said, the paperwork is ready to be stamped at the next department. And I said, well, I'm actually back in Los Angeles. Can I get a runner over there to pick it up and deliver? No, you're the one that signed for it. You're the one that submitted it. You're the one that has to take it to the next apartment. I said, I know that, but can I not sign an authority 
and they said, if you'd like us to put it on the back burner, we'll get back to it. By the way, we're quite backed up for about six months, which was a, a one of those kind yeah. of like, you don't do it now, and we're going to yeah. put yeah. it out to dry right. kind of thing. So I said, okay, then I, I, I'll, I'll be there early part of next week. Okay. And this was on a Friday. So grabbed my flight, quick pack, bang, jump over there, stayed at the hotel de Roussey, got a cab over to the, to um, the Thomas Aquinas house, go in there, waited outside the door. And this is where you're not going to believe it. Okay. They called me in. I walked up to the sister's desk. She looked at the documentation, stamped it handed me a piece of paper that I had to sign saying that I had received it. I signed that. She handed me the document that had to be signed by the next department. And I said, thank you very much. <laughs> Where is this? <sighs> and the door that I had walked in, yeah, this is going to get ridiculous. The door that I had walked into or through was still open. On the opposite side of the corridor was another door that was open and another sister at the desk and she literally looked past me. She went right there. over there to her. <laughs> and I said to her, just so I'm correct, I've got to go through that door, cross the corridor, through the other door to that lady to get her to sign the document. She said, yes, submit it to her. She'll stamp it. And then you have to return it to me. Wow. And I was <laughs> so fuming. I said, I said, so I've come from LA to, to and she said, you could have waited, and I realized I was starting to aggravate her. Yeah. So just for shits and giggles, <laughs> I held my breath just to see if I could do it. I held my breath from her desk to the other person's desk just to validate to myself that I could actually hold my breath from one department to the other right. just to get her to stamp it. And right. then she went, thank you very much. It's submitted now. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had to go back to my hotel room and just kind of like scream into a pillow and then flew back. So that's the kind of bureaucracy that I dealt with that will mean that we will never, I will never accept any of those kind of tasks again. Yeah. Which is really a statement of your job is, can be very difficult. I mean, there's a lots of stuff mm. you have to deal with, um, in what you're doing, setting whether it is setting up a party or an experience for someone, you're just you're dealing with all kinds of stuff, and you're the way of you doing it is stepping through it, you know, each yeah. piece, just okay, okay, you know, and stepping through it and getting it done. You do all these crazy parties, crazy experiences for people, impressive, amazing things, and do you ever feel like do you put pressure on yourself or do you feel like people are always looking for you to one up it to the, to another level or to another level or another level Does, or have you kind of come to a place where you don't have to put that kind of pressure on yourself? You know, the answer to this, <laughs> we're entrepreneurs. Do you know what I would really hate? I would hate for me to be in the exact same position financially, mentally that I am today in 12 months time zero growth, zero attempts at trying something different, right. zero change in experiences. So when someone would come to me, yeah, you're damn right. I put myself under pressure because yeah. I want to know, all right, Sims, what are you capable of? What's the next? Okay. How can you step your game up? See, I've often said that the experiences that I've built are my experiences that my clients just happen to go on. You know, I've done it to see how far I can push the boundary. Um, and I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed challenging myself. I've enjoyed empowering myself, knowing what I'm capable of doing. So the bottom line of it is being under pressure isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can be if you let it be. Yeah. But for me, it's the kind of thing that makes me want to go, all right, all right. I love being pushed. I like getting people and helping their businesses grow. I like reevaluating the message on their website. I like getting them to, to do different things, to think different things. I love getting people uncomfortable. Because as you said, the rich person that was born rich or that won the lottery, they've got no education to share. There's yeah. no growth. Right. They haven't learned anything. Just imagine if you built a widget in two seconds, sold it for a million, and then just made a compound interest rate of 15% a year. What bloody lesson have you got to give? Right. Okay. 
But it's the person that's been broke, the person that's fallen over, the person that's lost a contract, the one that's been sued, the one that built a great business, sold a great business, built another business, went broke, and then built another business. That's the person with all the education you need. Right, right. And, you know, I'll go out and do a run of shows for a month and be like, exhausted you know just physically exhausted by the time i get home and then i get home and i'm sitting in front of the tv a couple days later and <laughs> it's that feeling of just like why was i waiting to get here you know just to sit here in front of the tv i mean it's yeah. nice to have a couple days of rest i won't complain about that but it's it's tough so really it's in your dna to keep kind of pushing yourself along making things interesting each day and each each thing you're gonna do you want to keep interesting for yourself. So you're looking for challenges out there. I think every entrepreneur is like that, aren't they? Every entrepreneur wants to push and strive and go, well, okay, conquered that. I'm done. When I, when I did the Florence dinner, I got the dinner. I got the location. I got the chef and I got the string quartet all in one day. And I was actually quite impressed with myself that I'd got all the approvals I needed yeah. in one day. Yeah. I had another 24 hours. This was done on the Monday and the client's dinner was on the Wednesday. It was literally noon on Tuesday that I was sitting there in Florence, knowing what I had pulled off, knowing what was going to be done, that I literally went, all right, well, I got that. <laughs> How can I make this a little bit better? And I started going down this road. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, I made a phone call to some people. And uh, I said to them, I said, who's the most powerful, uh, famous singer in Florence? Let's start at the top. You know, yeah. always start at the top. Who is the person? And they went, Andrea Bocelli. And I phoned up Andrea Bocelli's agent that was in London. Okay. And I told him what I wanted him to do. Right. He laughed at me. Actually, she laughed at me and said to me, we'll check and we'll call you back. Yeah. And isn't it funny that they didn't even ask for my phone number when they were saying that? <laughs> so when they hung up, I was like, oh, well, that's not. So then what I did was I phoned a couple of people, a couple of performers that I know, and um, they made a phone call. And then Veronica phoned me, Andrea's wife, saying, what time do you need him there? Yeah. So that was how the whole thing came. So it's always good to be able to go through somebody else's credibility, but I didn't accept the first person laughing at me to be the no. I yeah. was going to go, well, okay, it's got to be another angle. And I just tried a couple of players. I was willing to go to the next most famous person, but gladly I didn't need to. Do you think um, the fact that sometimes money is no object is really what helps find people like that? And, and you often are, once in a while have to find the next one down or the next one down level to make things interesting. So I've discovered when you play at that level, money's got nothing to do with it. Yeah. Okay. Now this may sound wrong, but money is like the assumption. Like when you buy a car, you know, you're going to have to stick gasoline in it. Okay. Right. You know that there's going to be a payment, but I remember <coughs> being next to Elton John at his Oscar party and this guy came up to him and he said, hey, how much would it cost for me to get you to come and sing at my barbecue? Okay. Right. And that one, John just turned around and he said, I'm sorry, I'm busy. And then walked off. Now, he didn't give the guy, the guy didn't give a date, a time, a location, nothing. But what he tried to do was to create a transaction and almost prostitute Elton in order to be doing this. You know, how much do I have to pay for you to do this for me? Right. You know, it was a transaction. What you've got to do when you're in that situation is go, look, I'm creating a story. I'm creating a memory. I'm creating the most amazing because I've been challenged to create the ultimate Italian dining experience. It's not going to be the ultimate unless it has the ultimate at, at it. Right. Wouldn't this be a story you would like to be part of? Get them actually into your dream on the knowledge that you're going to have to pay for the fuel. But Whoops. that's how you do it with each one of those people. Which, you get them into the dream and the passion and the story first. Right. Um, I think you were the one who said they'll make it easy for them to say yes. Was that something like you, when yep. anytime you have a situation like that with someone or a client or someone, you you set it up in a way that it's, it's easy to say yes for them to instead of saying no. Right? Yeah, there's. I learned, and again, this is from doing it wrong. 
I realized years ago that if I was getting the wrong answer, it's because I was asking the wrong question. So if I said to you, if I said to you, for argument's sake, um, cause you've got some beautiful guitars behind you. Yes. If I said to you, um, Hey, can I, you know, I don't play guitar, but I want to mess around. Can I, can I borrow your guitar to, to <laughs> play around? If I said that to you, the easiest answer for you to give me would be no easiest. Right. Right. But if I said to you, Oh, I love those. Those guitars are beautiful. They speak to me. Um, let me ask you, what do we need to do for you to let me just hold one of those guitars? Right. If I start rephrasing it and reframing it, right. if I said that to you and you turned around and you went, no, <laughs> you sound like an illiterate moron because I haven't asked you yes or no. I've said, hey, what's going to happen for me to be right. able to hold one of those guitars? If you go, no, you just sound like a moron. Right, so right. it's no longer in your vocabulary. You have to think about a response. And as long as you're responding and avoiding the no word, I can channel you back to get the answer I want. Okay. Yeah. I've just got to find out what is it that's going to invigorate you to do what I want you to do and make you happy about doing it. That's brilliant. And then you put a book together, The Art of Making Things Happen, which is, <laughs> you know, let's talk about that for a minute. What made you want to write all this down or write a book? About I didn't. All? This is going to make you laugh. Um, great things happen when you're in rooms full of great people. So I always realized that if I want good things to happen, surround myself with good people. And I was at a party in New York and I'm at a bar in Manhattan. And thankfully I'm with my wife and this young girl is talking to me. And I was actually telling her the story of Bocelli in uh, Florence. Right. And she suddenly, and I'm not even about smoothly, slams her drink down and runs away from me. <laughs> now, I quickly looked at my wife thinking, what? did I say something inappropriate? <laughs> did, uh... Now, she moved at such speed that the guy behind her that wasn't even part of our conversation felt her move, looked at me to go, what did you what do? What did you do, buddy? <laughs> you know? And I'm stood there just perplexed going, shit. Did I say something wrong? And I wasn't sure what it was. She came back to me dragging this older woman. And as she came out of me, she went, start again. Tell that story. <laughs> start at the beginning. And so I went, oh, okay then. So now I was kind of a bit relaxed. And I told the Bocelli story, okay? Turns out this woman was one of the big ups in uh, Simon & Schuster, the uh, one of the largest publishing houses in America. Nice. And she said, you need to write a book on all the big, famous, and important people you've dealt with. And I said, look, I've got some colorful characters in my Rolodex. If I wrote that book, I'd be dead before cocktail hour. <laughs> um, and, and that was it. That was the end of it. We swapped details, but that was the, the end of it. A week later, on a Thursday, I got off the motorbike to a text, and it was like, you know, check your email. I checked my email, and I had a contract for the book. And they said, we want to reframe it. We want to know how a bricklayer from London yeah. can be dealing with all of these people. We want the how-tos. Don't mention names, but we want to know behind the curtain. And so they offered me some money. Uh, a friend of mine is Jay Abraham. And so I said to Jay, I've never written a book before. What should I do? And he straight away said, ask for more money, which I did. <laughs> they said yes, which was absurd. <laughs> um, and uh, that was it. They got me a ghostwriter. Um, and we set about writing this book. And the funny thing is, writing a book, it's like a therapy session. You stand there and you go, well, I did this, 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 and then I did this. You think this is your piece of magic. And the person writing the book goes, hang on a minute, what were the two steps you did before that? And you just go, oh, it was, it was this and this. Yeah. And you glance, and she, and the lady said to me, she said, you don't realize people aren't doing those little steps. You know, the thing that you think is the, is the trigger, that's just the result of the momentum created from these two little things which people are ignoring. So we, we wrote the book, um, and here's the funny thing. We wrote the book, and we had to write two chapters for them to like the way it was going. Right. So what we did was we worked in reverse. We would do bullet points on what the, the first chapter was going to include. And then the second thing, with the second chapter, again, 
bullet points of what the second chapter would include. And we marked these down as our cheat sheets. You know, what are we going to be talking about in this chapter? We're going to be uncovering the act of being impossible to misunderstand, the ROI of relationships, how to ask why three times and why, you know? And yeah. so we wrote all of this. <clears throat> when we submitted it to Simon and Schuster, we left that in there by accident. And they came back to us and they went, oh, having that cheat sheet it's at brilliant. the end of each chapter, that's brilliant. And we were like, <laughs> fantastic. So we actually did it uh, for the for the whole chapters. And uh, I actually, the, do you know the Everly on uh, Sunset Boulevard? Yeah. The whiskey bar? Yeah. They asked me to go down to Barnes and Noble, rent a table and actually sign copies of my book on a Saturday afternoon when it released. Right. And I said, no one, no one in the world is going to come up to me on a Saturday afternoon and, you know, have me sign a book. Right. So instead, I just said, nah, sod it. I'm going to do my kind of launch party. And if you go, shallow plug, but it's, it's not pixeled or anything. <laughs> but if you go to stevedsims.com, you'll actually see my book launch. And I took over a whiskey bar in Hollywood. Yeah. And I, I invited some cool characters to it. And we just got drunk. That's and great. so at the, at the beginning of the video, everyone's kind of like, it's such an honor to be here. Yeah, and right. Steve's such a... And then as it gets to the end of the video, if you don't like cursing, yeah. end the video before... But they all start <laughs> getting drunk and abusive. But that's, that's how it happened. Um, the video came out. The book came out. People saw the video. They saw more of me. For two months, I had pretty shitty sales. Um, in fact, Simon Schuster said to me when I would call him for the numbers, they said... Don't call us again. We'll let you know how it's going. <laughs> and then on the third month, it just shot up. And now it's been in Thai, Thailand, Vietnam, Korea, Mandarin, Chinese, uh, Polish. And it's just got released in Russian. And it's been a bestseller all over the planet. And it's just insane. Yeah, I've been wanting to write down stories too. But when I try to think of anything sitting here, it's like I, I can't remember much of anything. But I was hired to just be at a dinner with people once they just wanted me to i had to play an event the next day but the first night they just wanted me to come to dinner with them and i was like okay you know and and they just started asking me questions at that dinner and stuff just started pouring out of me that i didn't even know was in there they would be like oh i remember i was at this one show or didn't you that one tour when you played and didn't you know and all this kind of stuff i was like oh yeah 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 and then it would just suck it right out of me till it was finally just pouring out so someday i hope to get around to writing this stuff down too as well because i can't think of it on my own but it's there somewhere Hey, ring me up, man. I'll be happy to steer you in the right direction. And I think there's, whiskey there, will there's some, help. <laughs> yeah, whiskey, whiskey always helps. We know that. Uh, that should be a t-shirt. Um, yeah. But a good, a good ghostwriter, in fact, Simon Schuster taught me this. A good ghostwriter is there to translate your memories into a language that other people will understand and resonate to. Yeah. So a good ghostwriter actually becomes like a therapist and starts asking you the questions that gets you to do that. And they would literally just phone me up every afternoon at three o'clock. I'll be fiddling around with one of my motorbikes and we would just chat for an hour. Right. Um, and then they would just start writing stuff based on that conversation while I'm in the garage. Yeah. And so now obviously Bluefish is still doing what it does every year, but do you find yourself doing uh, more motivational speaking and stuff as well to people trying to, uh, you know, work with just almost more of a Steve Sims brand as, as opposed to necessarily Bluefish and what they do? Yeah, I kind of, I moved away from Bluefish probably about four years ago. I feel as though I'd got everything out of it. The right. book came out and all of a sudden there was a new tribe that was asking me questions. Right. So people were saying to me, Hey, do you coach? And I'd be like, I don't know. What do you need? And they'd be like this, this and I'm like, yeah, I could do that. So I ended up starting the coach. Um, and then I was doing a lot of speaking. I, I've literally spoke, I won't say all over the world, but a, but a good, you know, 60% of it. Yeah. Um, and now the live gigs are coming back. In fact, tomorrow I'm going mm. down to San Diego. That'd be the third time speaking in San Diego in nine weeks. Wow. Um, so it's all starting to come back now. Um, but I do a lot of speaking, a lot of coaching. Um, we do a lot of media for other companies. You know, we launched a company called Sims.media. Um, and we found that that's, that's my new excitement. Yeah. Getting other people 
to think outside of their box, to challenge themselves to more, to expect, not settle and demand more of themselves. That's where my excitement is now. Yeah, it's kind of like evolution. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you never imagine these things. But when you get to this point, all of a sudden, it seems like the most natural thing in the world. And I have to say, yeah, listening to you talk, it's incredibly inspirational to people. And, and I love, you know, my feeling is I want to come hang out with you for a while. <laughs> if you've got a back bedroom or something I can stay in, we'll just... But it's that feeling kind of that you give bring off. Bring a and, guitar. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll bring <laughs> one for you, man. I build these myself, so I... That's another thing I didn't connect with was the guitars in the music store. So I thought, why am I trying to play that guitar when I can just make one that make, fits me better? So my guitar <laughs> company's called Bastard Guitars because I've bastardized them ever since I picked one up and started tearing them apart and putting them back together and stuff. But it's really inspirational talking to you. I, I have a few questions that I ask kind of in general and very simple questions. So if you will indulge me just for a couple more questions here. Yep. Um, the difference between time and work, um, and you know, work and life. Do you do you have any kind of rules that you install into your life about it? Uh, have you learned anything where, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work my ass off this much, and I'm gonna make sure I have this much time with like life and family and kids and kind of stuff? Has there ever been a rule like that for you? Yeah, and I learned it from the people that I started to associate with. Uh, they do an impact per hour. You know, this hour of my life, what impact is it creating? You know, that impact can make can be making your son smile. It can be making your wife laugh. It can be developing a business model. Yeah. So instead of going, hey, I'm going to work my ass off, ask yourself a question. In the next hour, what impact can I create? Um, and if you live with impact and move with impact, then you could take that across the whole board. Um, so I started realizing that successful affluent people they value time greater than non-successful people because they realize they can make more money but they can never make more time right so they make every hour count and that's one of the lessons i learned yeah it's time is so people say our biggest commodity or most precious yep. commodity here's yep. another question for you worst idea you ever had but that looked great on paper but turned out just kind of it's a terrible idea do you, have do you know <laughs> i think there's this may not be the answer you want but i don't think i've ever had that and Ooh. the reason i haven't had it is That's because great. i've reframed it let me let me let me ask you a question <laughs> have you have you ever trapped your thumb or your finger in a car door yes. or you've hit it with a hammer or you've dropped something on your toe Yes. Have absolutely. you done that? Yep, I sure have. Right. So let me let me ask you the question. Did it hurt? It hurt bad. <laughs> it hurt bad. It hurt bad. Yeah. Okay. Now let me ask you this question. Can you actually remember what it felt like? Well, yes and no. I mean, I don't remember the pain, but I remember it. You remember the education that it right. wasn't a good thing to do, but you don't remember the pain because human beings we actually forget pain. If we didn't forget pain, you know, there's right. no way in the world women would have a second child. Exactly, yeah. And there's no way in the world would get another tattoo, you know, because those <laughs> things bloody hurt. And then six, I've got tattoos. And every time I'm having one, I'm like, I am never doing this again. And then three months later, you're yeah. like, oh, that looks nice. Oh, yeah, too, yeah. yeah, we forget pain. That's the exact same thing with business mistakes. If you can make sure that out of every stupid idea, and yes, millions, out of every stupid idea you delved in to find out where the education in it, then it becomes education. It's no longer a stupid idea. You just learned something. Right. And if you can learn something from all your idiocies, from all your stupid ideas, it keeps you perpetuating to try new things. So that one, keeps the momentum going. And two, that education becomes experience, which becomes credibility and confidence. And that's invoiceable. So no, I've never done anything stupid. The only stupid things I've ever done is stuff that I've never learned from. Right, right. Good answer. And then the best idea that you ever had, would it be considered a financial gain or a life gain? Like something you, an experience you gain rather than a financial gain? Um, never financial. 
Um, I think one of the stupid things people do is they look to their finances. Your finances are a byproduct of how successful you are, not the other way around. Okay. It's like you lose weight by action in a diet book, not by buying the diet book. Exactly. So, so the, I, I noticed a, a big shift and it was lucky because I was so, um, I suppose, illiterate, stupid, cocky. When I spoke to people, I spoke to them as normal people. I didn't speak to them as billionaires. I didn't speak to them as famous people. Right. So I realized of the importance of speaking in an authentic, transparent manner. And today, with the amount of shit that's out there in the planet and the amount of noise and confusion, clarity is what we're all looking for. If you can speak to someone and you get them within a couple of seconds, then that's the position you want to be in. Absolutely. Well, I want to say thank you for being here and talking just because it's extremely inspirational. I love hearing you talk. I love hearing your stories. Everybody... I'm sure enjoys hearing this and um, look for the book, The Art of Making Things Happen. Lots of lessons in there. And um, Steve Sims coming to his town near you, find him. Come <laughs> listen to him talk and thank you so much or, or, or go find a bluefish party. It'll blow your mind, right? I appreciate it. And hopefully you'll be at the next one. We've I would both love been to. there strumming. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I'm for hire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, pal. Bye-bye. What a great interview we had with Mr. Steve Sims. Um, I was inspired just sitting here listening to him and talking to him uh, about his stories. Please subscribe to Staring at the World. Search for Staring at the World podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. And um, join us and look forward to new podcasts. We'll keep trying to make it as interesting as humanly possible for you. 